Hello, um, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. Uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. So I am Joanna Metz and I am the Publishing and Repository Services Librarian at Ohio State University. Um, and I kind of wanted to begin by giving you some contextual information about the work of my unit uh, in the libraries. So my responsibilities include overseeing both our institutional repository and publishing programs. Uh, we have three full-time staff people, uh, two program assistants, each delegated to either the institutional repository and the library publishing programs respectively. And they are supervised by the production services manager. And then I supervise the production services manager directly. Um, our publishing program currently publishes 12 active journals and hosts three active journals. And we primarily use open journal systems, uh, otherwise known as OJS, as our publishing platform. But we also use our institutional repository, which is a DSpace repository. And one of our journals is published in WordPress as well. Uh, our IT department is responsible for maintaining our instance of open journal systems, as well as for troubleshooting and fixing any technical issues that arise with the platform. And typically, if there is an issue that has been reported to us by a journal editor, for example, or if we notice an issue, we put in a ticket with our IT department and they work on finding a solution. So that brings me to the events of this summer. Um, our instance of open journal systems or OJS was hacked, uh, which resulted in the journal websites being unavailable for about two weeks. And then after about two weeks, our IT department was able to put up um, what they referred to as read only versions of the sites. So for the next month, uh, though the already published journal content was available, no one could log into the sites, which meant that no new submissions could be received. Um, no editorial work could be done and nothing could be published. So throughout this time, our IT department was working on a fix for our instance of OJS, as well as on the other sites that were affected by the hack. And as I mentioned, uh, while the sites themselves were entirely inaccessible for that two week time period, uh, we were able to redirect visitors to a page, letting them know that they could write to us, uh, well, email us and request copies of articles that they needed urgently. And though all of our journal sites were unavailable uh, or were available in the Internet Archives Wayback Machine, not all of the archived article pages had been included on that site. So we weren't able to direct most users to these archives. And instead, uh, we rely largely on copies of articles that we have published uh, that are kept on a shared network drive. And we had these copies because we typeset uh, for some of our journals. And even for those that we don't typeset, we usually have some role in the creation of the final published version of the article, whether that's adding a DOI uh, or a copyright information or a publication date. And we save a copy of that final version of any article that we work on in any capacity. So as I mentioned, uh, after about two weeks, our IT department was able to restore the journal sites in this read-only form so visitors could read and download articles again, uh, but no one could log in or use the back end. And when our sites were initially made available for us to test before they went live, many of them were missing their policy pages. And our IT department was able to restore the pages when I pointed out the issue. Um, but the hack itself and the lack of the complete archives in the Internet Archives Wayback Machine, as well as the initial absence of these policy pages on the site, made me think about what we're actively preserving and what we're not actively preserving. And then in general, kind of the impact and the ethical implications of these choices. Uh, when I think about our journal sites and all of the information on them, beyond the articles themselves, uh, to me, the policies are the most important content. All of our policies are the result of a lot of time and effort. Uh, we work hard to word them in a way that's clear and concise. They also usually involve some level of collaboration with editors, which can be time consuming. And in addition, we make an effort to pay attention to developments so that our policies reflect the current best practices. And each time a policy is changed, the old version is written over on the website and is no longer accessible. There are also enough policies that I can't recall them all off the top of my head. And the policies differ somewhat between journals. 
So for example, there are some journals that have a policy about the ethical treatment of animals involved in research studies, but a policy like that isn't needed by all journals in all the subject areas that we publish. The bottom line is that I certainly couldn't recreate any of our policy lists off the top of my head, uh, let alone the exact wording of the policies themselves without a significant amount of time and effort. Um, I would also need to involve the journal editors so that they were aware of the inevitable changes. And ideally, I would not want to have to explain to them that we had lost all of our policies. Uh, happily, um, I inherited Ohio State's publishing program in 2020, and it has a very robust history of documentation that began long before my time at the university. Um, historically, my predecessors captured our journal policies in Word documents with a corresponding spreadsheet that tracked which journals have which policies and when they were last updated. And these files are also on our shared network drive. Uh, but my understanding of this tracking uh, is that this tracking was put in place uh, by my predecessors, mostly so that we had a record of past policies over time, so that should an author who had published uh, an article in the past raise an issue that involved our policies, we would know what the policies were on the site at the time their work was published. I'm not sure how common the practice is of keeping a historical record of policies, uh, but it is not something that I had been aware of or thought of in my previous position at a different institution that also had a publishing program. Uh, more recently this year, our unit has had some staff turnover and we have worked with our IT department to upgrade from OJS2 to OJS3. And in the midst of these changes, the regular updating of this policy documentation had fallen a little by the wayside. Um, although policy changes are often discussed with editors via email and could be pulled from there, it's not a great system for tracking something that's important, preserving something that's important. Uh, an email sent to one person is essentially a single point of failure. If they were to leave, that record would be lost and there's no extra effort, if there's no extra effort made to capture that information. So when this summer's hack happened and some policy pages were missing from the journal sites, even for the short time that they were, I wasn't confident that the most recent changes were reflected in our policy documentation. And I also wasn't confident that the pages had been recently captured by the Internet Archive. So how does ethics fit into this? Um, you know, we strive to have all of our journals follow the COPE principles of transparency and best practice in scholarly publishing, uh, which is also a requirement that the Directory of Open uh, also a requirement of the Directory of Open Access Journals. In terms of preservation, this says a journal's plan for electronic backup and preservation of, of access to the journal content, for example, access to main articles via Clocks or PubMed Central, in the event a journal is no longer published, shall be clearly indicated. But you know, what about content beyond main, article, main articles and their metadata? Um, in addition to policies being difficult or time consuming to recreate, and even though they fall outside of what is traditionally considered mandatory to preserve, I would suggest that it's advisable to consider preserving other content on journal sites from an ethical and just a practical perspective. Um, significantly, it is our journal's policies that really define and artic articulate their values. Uh, it's the policies that outline the journal's practices and procedures, including everything from a daily norm of peer review to how authorship itself is defined to more extraordinary circumstances like corrections or retractions or allegations of misconduct. Uh, making stances on these matters clear at both the publisher and the journal level is an essential part of ensuring that our work is done in an ethical manner. And as I've stated, um, developing and revising policies is the result of time and, of, at time and effort uh, throughout the entire time a journal is publishing. In fact, policies are meant to evolve with time. Uh, wording may need to change to reflect current thought and standards, and new policies will likely need to be added as values change. Uh, while the probability of completely losing journal policies off a website is low, and even though ours were missing for a short period of time, they were able to be restored. I still think it's worth considering the impact of a lack of preservation plan from both an ethical and practical perspective and working toward creating one to ensure that in addition to the articles and metadata, the journal policies themselves are preserved. So as we've discussed, uh, Ohio State Libraries already had uh, a good record of past policies for journals that we publish. Uh, however, we weren't capturing our publisher level, our publisher level policies and there also wasn't a systematic approach to preserving this content uh, in place in the event of staff turnover. 
So we decided to make sure that every time a policy is updated, that change is reflected in our, our documentation and our shared network drive. This can be done in many ways. Uh, we just plan to keep Word documents that have file names and contain dates. Um, we will also add a reminder to our shared Outlook calendar to double check that our record of policies is correct on an annual basis. So for us, this is pretty quick and simple. It doesn't take too much time and effort and is therefore reasonable to add to our existing work. But in addition to policies, uh, we also will begin saving author guidelines as well as click through author agreements in some way as dated Word documents on our shared, in the same way as dated Word documents on our shared network drive. Um, this will be good information to have in case an author does approach us after publication with a question covered by this information or by the author agreement. And then lastly, we also wanted to capture announcements in the same way. Uh, this is likely the least important of these records, uh, but sometimes announcements uh, that journal editors post will either ask uh, or ask us to post will contain information about special issues and their submission guidelines may prove uh, useful in the future. So if you're not already capturing your policies or other ancillary material on the journal websites and you'd like to start, I would say it's likely easiest to start where you are, so to speak. And by that, I mean starting by documenting your policies as they are today and then as they evolve moving forward. Um, if you do have some records of past policies in your email account, that's where most of mine are, or elsewhere, you could try to find and capture them. But obviously, that involves more time. And then while it's regrettable that our instance of OJS was hacked, uh, we were fortunate that no data was lost. However, dealing with the fallout from the hack has made me think more about planning for a middle ground sort of emergency, uh, though we didn't lose data or have to call on our preserved journal articles and metadata through clocks, having local copies of these articles we published that we could send to users who needed them while the sites were down proved invaluable. I don't think that hacks or any instance where journal sites are down for an extended period of time are the norm, but it did happen to us. And though our job is to work to communicate with journal editors and authors, among others, we had no control over when our sites would be back online. And so thinking through both the ethical and practical sides of the situation in terms of the content itself, as well as for information like policies on the site will continue to be helpful to us moving forward. Again, these efforts are quite low effort and didn't take much time. So we're, we were comfortable with adding them to our already existing workflows and practices. And that is me wrapped up. And I think Mary and I are gonna share a Q&A period. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Yes, well, thank you, Q&A after Mary. And uh, Mary, I think your slides are here. I'll turn it over to our tech expert. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and introduce yourself. I'll bring up your slides and let you know when you can take Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Almansick. I'm the Director of Business Operations for a company named Repeta. That's Italian for please repeat, as in repeat your experiment, replicate it. Um, and uh, we're a part of digital science. And um, I'm here today presenting on, um, in lieu of Cynthia Hudson Vitelli, who had a, a last minute conflict. So, fortunately, could not be here. We're just waiting for PowerPoint to open. <laughs> this is beyond my technical expertise. There we go. Very good. I should say, um, I'm here from St. Louis, where we have another prestigious university named after um, George, George Washington. Um, okay, so you can use that to advance your slides. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I need to get to that one second. Sorry, there are many, many components, and there's only one little, little laptop. There's my face. Apologies. The problem is I can't get to Zoom. There it is. I need to go here. I need to go there. There. This back up. Open that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we get you seeing it? Yep. All right, great. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, um, so yeah, I'm here to talk today a little bit about reducing bias in peer review through automated authorship checks. Um, so just a little roadmap or agenda of what we'll talk about, um, or what I'm going to talk about, um, just give a little bit of background in um, bias in authorship, bias in authorship and peer review, uh, the rise of fake authors and bad actors in publishing, um, talk a little bit about trust in authorship and peer review and um, how can we gain that trust and reduce biases, and then talk a little bit about current solutions, including, including some that we have developed on our, our side. So um, just kind of like thinking back a little bit to set the context, um, the prehistory of peer review began when, back like in the 1600s, when um, scholarly societies would get together and discuss each other's articles after the fact, after it had been um, published, but also to kind of drive the science forward. Um, around the early to mid 19th century, what we know of as early article refereeing um, was established and began being adopted across um, various scholar scholarly uh, society publishing programs. And then um, fast forwarded, the practice of refere refereeing manuscripts became way more widespread after World War II and the Cold War. Um, and then by the 17, 19, 1970s, the refereeing, refereeing process became a critical component of the scientific and publication workflow. It's also at the time when the, the term peer review was coined widely. All right, so kind of diving into the, the concepts of uh, bias and authorship and peer review and starting with gender. Um, Basically, bias in authorship is a fraud subject. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> so some research has suggested there is, you know, not as much bias as we might think, or it's limited. Um, well, others um, have identified that, yeah, there is a potential for bias on gender, um, based on gender in the review process. And some studies have found its existence, but have been failed to be replicated. And then others have um, been had a reversal of findings when attempting to replicate. Um, in 2017, Helmer et al. analyzed publicly available data regarding the identities of about 9,000 editors, 43,000 reviewers, and about 126,000 authors from the Frontier series of journals from 2007 through 2015. And since the reviewers and ident editors were identified, they were able to analyze the relationships um, and the probabilities and found the following. Basically, women were underrepresented in the peer review process. Editors of both genders appeared to have some same gender preferences in, um, in when they're finding reviewers or homophily, seeking out others like yourself. And um, that the mechanism of this homophily is gender dependent. So basically they found that some gender differences, um, there are some differences across the genders in the strength of the effect. For example, um, there was a smaller than chance probability that male authors or male editors um, to assign female reviewers and that was generally widespread across male editors, um, although in varying strengths. However, in contrast, the, there was an overall larger than chance probability that um, women editors um, would appoint female reviewers. And, um, but this effect was kind of found to be due to a small number of um, really strongly homophilic female editors and with most of the other um, female editors showing a little bit less of that baseline. In 2018, there was a title for a study reported in science where applicants race or gender doesn't appear to influence NIH peer reviewers. So to quote from the study lead, um, lifted straight from the article, I've made a career out of studying bias and how to overcome it. I know the problem to be real. But here in this particular context, it may not be the place where the bias shows itself. That is from uh, psychologist Patricia, Patricia Devine of the University of Wisconsin. 
So just in general, it's complicated. Um, looking at uh, status bias in authorship and peer review. Um, the st status bias has been a little bit uh, more established in the science of science research or meta science. Um, in this study that we, we have illustrated here, the researchers invited more than 3,300 re uh, researchers to review a paper jointly written by a prominent author, who happened to be a Nobel laureate, and by a relatively unknown author, um, kind of a junior early career researcher, and uh, varying whether the reviewers see the prominent author's name have it completely anonymized, or they see the less prominent author's name. And they found strong evidence for a status bias, while only 23% recommend uh, reject when the prominent researcher is the only author shown, 48% do so when the paper is anonymized, and 65% do so when the little known author is the only author shown. And to be clear, these were the same articles. When we think about um, bias related to nationality or na nationality status, um, some descriptive studies have examined publication rates and citation counts, and they demonstrate a geographic skew towards high-income countries, or HICs. And research from low or middle-income countries, LMICs, is generally underrepresented. So this has been subjected or suggested to be due in part to the reviewers and editors' preference towards um, high-income country sources. However, there's um, a bit of a dearth of controlled studies, so it's not exactly possible to assert whether there's a bias or whether the variations in the quality or relevance of the articles being reviewed might explain some of the geographical divide. The study emphasizes um, the evidence from randomized and controlled studies that explore geographic bias in the peer review process. That's a scopic et al, if you can see. <laughs> the, um, the systematic literature review yielded 3,501 titles from which 12 full texts were reviewed and a further eight were identified through searching reference lists of the full text. Of these 20 articles, only three were randomized and controlled studies that examined the variance of a geographic bias. One study found that abstracts attributed to high income sources elicited a higher reviewer score regarding the relevance of the research and the likelihood to recommend the research to a colleague than did abstracts attributed to lower in income sources. Another study found that the predicted odds of acceptance for submissions to a computer science conference were statistically, in significant, statistically significantly higher for submissions from a top university, such as Harvard. So two of the three studies basically showed the presence of a geographical bias um, from articles between the high and the prestige uh, institutions. Okay, moving on to racial bias. Um, so here I've got um, some output from a study by Roberts et al, where he and his team review, reviewed more than 26,000 empirical articles that were published between 1974 and 19, I'm sorry, 2018. Across these journals, the author studied two key factors. First, they wanted to know how often uh, psychological science acknowledges the impact of race in the psychological phenomenon they're studying. And then second, they investigated the actual makeup of the entire publishing enterprise from editor to author to, um, to colleagues. Mm -hmm. And they turned to determine whether the people involved in generating and publishing this research were part of the STEM fields racial, racial disparity problems. So the results suggest suggests that there is a hierarchy in psychology research that determines who and what gets published. And to quote, we're not saying anyone has bad intentions, said Roberts. It's a system, it's a system systemic problem across many fields and psychological science is no exception. 
as a psych major, I'm a, quite sad actually about this, but that's <laughs> um, The key findings also included just two, uh, the following major points. So first, across the past five decades, articles in psychological journals that highlight race, race have been rare. And although developmental and social psychology journals have published a growing number of such studies, they have remained virtually non-existent in the area of cognitive psychology. Second, most journals have been edited by white editors under, under whom there has been a notable dearth of published articles highlighting race and racism. And then third, many of the publications that highlight race have been written by white authors and employ, who employ significantly fewer team members of color. Okay, so, so moving on from thoughts of, of, of bias, we also have this issue of the of rise in fake authors and bad, bad actors in publishing. Now we've all seen the stories that come out and if any of you follow Retraction Watch, you're familiar with this phenomenon. Um, and that's where kind of one thing we've been interested in in, in our work at Repeta. So we work to identify and to analyze trust markers of science. Um, some of that is to take a look at authorship issues. And through network and other types of analyses, we've identified some of the traits of various fake authors and bad actors in scientific publishing. So to kind of give you um, a little information, we have identified impersonators, which we kind of define as somebody taking the identi identity of another and using it as their own. So this would include when real researchers are added as a co-author um, without their consent or knowledge onto a, onto a paper and um, to allow to try to um, increase their reputation and, and uh, garner a benefit for the lead author. We also have issues where sometimes um, in a submission, a real researcher's name and affiliation is used for one of the co-authors, um, again, to add prestige to the article in theory, um, but they might change the, the, this person's email and just slightly so it's not obvious right away. So for example, we, um, we saw a case where somebody was representing that they were from the um, University of Beirut in Germany, which their email domain is usually UNI. Um, is it UNI? Yeah, UNI slash or dash um, Deleuz uh, or Beirut.de, and they changed it to UNIV something that would be really hard to miss as an editor receiving that submission, it would be really hard to catch that. All right, trying to keep an eye on time here. Um, the next thing we've kind of identified is the imposters. So imposters by definition, by definition are not who they say they are. They are a fictitious, fictitious persona that's not based on a real person. So we had um, identified a suspiciously high number of publications in the area of COVID by um, an author that went by the name of Kira Smith. And um, so in, in, in this case, through our investigation, we kind of figured out that Kira Smith is a fake lead author. Um, they only appear as a lead on the authors that they, um, or they only appear as a lead author on their articles. Kira presents themselves as a polymath researcher that was involved in military special operations and experimental medicine. And Kira's auth authored upwards of 20 preprints during the pandemic, all related to COVID, and um, often hosted on multiple preprint servers. And as you might be able to guess, a lot of the information wasn't exactly scientifically sound. Um, so basically, Kira raised a lot of red flags um, related to the publication timeframes, how many articles were, were, were pumped out in a short time period, um, co-authorships, their history, um, and the titles. But, but Kira also had a valid ORCID ID, as well as a unique research ID on multiple platforms. So 
And then um, another persona that we've identified, we refer to as peacocks. So these are real scientists that have real expertise in a particular area, but they might claim expertise in another area. Um, for example, there is a recent, I won't even mention his name, but there was a recent, uh, recent items in the news about, or in, in the scientific publishing news, um, there's a researcher who I believe is an electrical engineer who's publishing articles um, assessing the data in the VAERS database, the uh, Vaccine Adverse Events reporting system and using this information to show like, look, vaccines are more dangerous than COVID. Um, now this is, if I'm correct in the recalling the electrical engineer, probably not somebody qualified to understand how adverse events are trapped for, you know, INDs and other things under FDA investigation, et cetera, and using this data in, in potentially um, inappropriate way to, push some results that are spurious. So with the rise of all these bad actors and fake authors, we're getting a lot of scams being identified within the publishing world. Um, again, just a the co-authors not knowing they're being assigned as a co-author. Uh, we've got fake co-authors, unknowing lead authors, false affiliations, fake references, fake peer review, and fake lead authors. So another issue that um, we don't have on the slide too is also with paper mills. And that's when you're kind of plagiarizing other people's work. Um, sometimes they'll take and using AI tools, splice, splice together papers or splinching if you're a fan of the Harry Potter series, leaving a very Frankenstein's monster type of paper behind that still somehow is getting published. And this is just a little snapshot of an analysis we did. Um, we pulled data from the Retraction Watch database. This, is, this was pulled back in April of last year. So my apologies for not getting an updated data on this. But it just kind of shows, um, gives you a sampling of the retractions um, due to authorship issues. So related to paper mills, misconduct, uh, lack of approvals, probably ethical approvals, um, forging, fake peer review, et cetera. So it's, it's, it comes back to harm um, both the, the institutions and the publishers that are, are unfortunately not catching some of the, the bad information getting out there. So how can we trust an authorship and peer reviewers and reduce human biases? So some of the current solutions, um, double-blind peer review is a big one. So with double blind peer review, identities of both authors and reviewers are kept hidden from each other. And it's been used in imaging, nursing, humanities journals, among others. And by the end of 2021, all of IOP owned physics journals moved to a double anonymous um, peer review system as well, adopting the approach across their, their entire portfolio. Um, in a blog posted by Fave Holst, seen here, um, early data seems to suggest that the approach may be working. Um, papers submitted double anonymous are more likely to be accepted, as one finding they're, they're showing so far. And this effect appears to be not just for marginalized, underrepresented groups, but across the board. So authors who anonymize their work were more likely to be successful in getting it published. She also reports that authors who identify as a woman or non-binary were more likely to anonymize their work than those who identify as a man, suggesting that these people, um, quote, perceive bias as a lived experience and value the option to anonymize their work. Double anonym anonymous peer review is not a panacea for all inequality issues in publishing, and there's still a lot of work to be done. But as a society publisher, we see it as an important step as we continue to expand the world of physics for the benefit of all. 
The Halfer et al. review notes that this may not solve all of the problems, of course, um, or bias from reviewers, and some bad behavior will persist, such as you know, plagiarizing the work you're reviewing, um, as well as the occasional deliberate delay of the review to slow roll it so you can get your publication out first. Um, so they rightly note a reviewer may take a longer time in a double blind system because he or she may spend a lot of time uncovering the author's identity instead of focusing on the proper review of the manuscript. Uh, so true blinding can be difficult to achieve. Um, as they note that the reviewers can um, successfully, oops, as they note that um, reviewers have been able to successfully identify um, the authors in about 25 to 50 percent of cases in biomedical or social science journals. They might be familiar with the author's work, especially if it's in a little niche area. Um, and the authors may self-reference -refer themselves in the text, our previous work shown, um, as well as in self-citations. And um, through reference to their institutions and or their ethical approval statement that describes their IRB. Um, so a lot of things to think about through that. Um, and just kind of there are other solutions, uh, just being mindful of time. Um, the yeah, triple blind peer review, where in addition to the um, blinding the, of the reviewers and author's identity, the author's identity is also hidden from the editor. And then quadruple, quadruple blind re peer review, where following all the other steps of the double and triple blind process, but augmenting by hiding the identity of the handling editor. Um, we also have open peer review where um, basically both authors and reviewers know the identity of each other. And the idea is that it encourages transparency and openness, constructive criticism from reviewers, um, and might help prevent plagiarism. However, it's also associated with a higher refusal rate from reviewers and increased time to complete reviews. Um, in addition, authors may be asked to identify reviewers who may be more favorable than um, those identified by editors. And more ominously, this approach may be conducive to scientific fraud as well. Um, and some of the um, work that we did looking at the imposters and, and, um, and other types of fraud, we, we kind of like, you could see citation mills and wonder if, if there are also peer review kind of schemes going on there. All right, so in general, it just seems like there, there is a little more research that's needed to identify and address the potential for bias in scholarly publishing. Many publishers are, are focusing efforts towards this issue. Um, and as recently reported in Nature, there's a huge endeavor to track diversity in research journals. They have more than 50 publishers representing over 15,000 journals globally that are getting together to prepare to ask scientists um, some sensitive information uh, as they submit. Basically, um, authors, reviewers, and, and editors, uh, basically about their race, their ethnicity, their gender, and, and um, basically they want to be able to, to analyze the kind of researcher diversity around the world and, and how it impacts these different processes. Okay. How much more time do you have? Okay, let me just go through a few things quickly here then. So kind of how we're at Rapeda and Digital Science trying to target some of these challenges. So if we can identify um, the scientific trust markers within manuscripts that, that are just indicative of, of a quality researcher, quality uh, project, then this could be a useful tool. Um, in assessing both the, you know, kind of the research, the quality, the professionalism, and the reproducibility of the submission, as well as the, um, the potential for the authors to be good actors. So in thinking through this, we have kind of through literature and um, other work, we've kind of identified some of the big science kind of trust markers in manuscripts. So if you think about it, as you're reviewing a manuscript, what are some of the things you look for to, to determine if it's quality? You might see if they have a data availability statement, 
Are they sharing their data? Is the data there? Is it um, available upon request where it'll be lost in five years as the researcher moves and can't find it? Or is it in a repository with a DOI where you can get access to it in, in the protocol? So this is just an example, but we kind of break down our trust markers into transparency, reproducibility, and research classification. Um, on the transparency, do you include an author, author contri contribution statement? Do you also include what, um, an ethical approval statement, co competing interest statement, um, et cetera? Reproducibility, again, the data availability statement, is that included, code availability, software, um, et cetera. And then also we try to align um, the, the trust markers that we, we work to identify with some of the reporting guidelines from various publishers, things such as um, MDAR, Arrive, et cetera. And while we have a lot of overlap with some of them, we're continuing to build out and identify more and more of these trust markers. For author um, kind of trust marker examples on uh, examples on author validity, we can look at things like email or domain fails. Um, is the email found to be dead? Um, sometimes that can happen when somebody changes institutions, but if you're submitting something right then, the odds are typically that you're at that institution that you're stating. Not all the time, like in the case of postdocs who move and things like that. Um, are there intentionally fake domains like the example I mentioned before from the University of Beirut in Germany. Um, we might identify some things that might be okay, but needs a little investigation just to make sure. For example, do the authors have um, a commercial email and no ORCID? Some in some uh, like Asian countries, it's common to use your like a, a commercial email um, on your submission. But do you also not have an ORCID? There, there are other kinds of signs that are ways that you can kind of help um, establish your, your um, credibility. Um, did the email and the institution not match, et cetera? And then there are also kind of like known, known issues like the Camille New um, is a known alias account that's, that's um, used by multiple authors. And if, you have, if you're not familiar with this, it has to do with um, kind of a, a French researcher protest about some changes in, in their um, research policies. So we know this is a known issue, so we wouldn't. Um, there's also a lady who I think every um, April Fool's publishes a paper that's co-authored by her cat or authored by her cat. I'm blanking on her name. It's really funny, but we're not going to fault her for that type of um, activity. So with Repeta, we've kind of put together a, a method to pull these scientific mar markers and continue to kind of continuously try to improve them. So we use natural language processing, data engineering algorithms, machine learning models to generate these trust markers that, that we just showed. As long as we can keep an eye on bias in AI, in AI keep that in check, then um, the automation and technology could be useful here. So for example, we can take one singular submission, run it through our processes, and then kind of pump out a report identifying the different trust markers. We also have been developing the ability to kind of do an author check, which will be useful during the submission process, obviously. Um, it will help um, publishers be able to kind of use these algorithms to check for email peculiarities, impersonators, and uh, regular networks, any kind of publishing history oddities, like you know, 500 articles in a two-year period, things like that. Um, we are able to leverage the Dimensions database. And for those who don't know, it's a, a data aggregated um, system based on 15 million unique authors and millions and millions of publications and captures data related to all the authors, co-authors, funding, and a lot of additional information that's useful. We also leverage the um, ORCID system as well as GRID. I'm almost done, I promise. 
Um, so through these, these tool, the tool that we've developed, we're able to kind of um, do a pre-check that will you know, help identify trust markers before publication. And of course, it'll help publishers ensure good science process through the and an ef more efficient augmented review. But then we also have taken our algorithms and run them against 33 million publications that are within the Dimensions um, system going back to 2010. And we've been able to develop these trust markers on, the, on, the, on that, that corpus of papers. And we're referring to this data set as Dimensions Research Integrity. So this can be useful for many purposes. You can um, identify historical trends and it can also be useful for identifying potential peer reviewers that have good quality science and in the, in the trust markers associated with their work and maybe are in different regions or within the same um, research domain, but in, in other geographical locations, other demographics, et cetera, so that you can kind of um, have a more diverse selection for your uh, peer review considerations. And with that, thank you for your time. And here's our contact information. If you have any questions or want any further information. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and we do have time for some a few questions for either Joanna or Mary or both. Uh, any questions from the audience here? Again, uh, as a reminder for those uh, that are listening online, please use the interact button at the bottom of your screen to ask a question. Uh, I'll ask a question of Joanna um, about your, um, assist your version of OJS getting hacked. I know you're very involved in the Library Publishing Coalition because we work together in that. Uh, have you heard of other um, library publishers or other journal publishers through your um, investigations? Have you heard of other ones getting hacked like that? I have not. I have not, and I also have not uh, heard from our IT department any details about the how it happened piece. Uh, so my hope is that we are a unique situation. I guess you just got lucky. Huh? Yeah. Uh, but I, I thought that um, the lessons that you provided were, were really were very valuable. Um, Question for Mary, um, in terms of the um, things like uh, imposters and I forget exactly the other term they use. Uh, impersonators. Yeah, impers uh, um, can you tell if that is increasing? Is it going up or is it hard to, is it hard to tell historically? It may be hard to tell historically. I haven't seen a kind of a systematic analysis or assessment of that, but that would be fascinating to look at. And, uh, how to the process from data standpoint so just tell if someone even qualified they have their qualifications how to So I think if, if I understood your question correctly, and, and please correct me if I didn't, um, I think that uh, it, it is really challenging following, finding qualified peer reviewers. I, I know myself when I've gone through publication and we're going through a peer review and, and or open review and we have to find people, it's hard. And, and you have to kind of like put on a cap or I need to be ethical. I need to find good quality people that know this but I also have a personal relationship with them. And 
So it, there are a lot of challenges for this. So I think the more that we can utilize um, some of the data that is available to us to kind of identify perhaps um, bad actor networks and things like that, um, but then also to identify people that are doing good and are following ethical processes and do have the expertise to assess the data and, and et cetera. Um, I think that could go a long way towards, towards helping in this situation. Um, I was chatting with somebody earlier and I mentioned I, I had been at a RDA conference where I heard a gentleman speak and I, I apologize, he was either from UCLA or Stanford, I believe, but he was talking about how in their office, they have like a, 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 they review submissions before they go out the door from their institutional researchers. And they actually give us the data, give us your code, and we need to be able to replicate it. So they kind of take some internal controls a step further. Now, obviously not every institution may have those types of resources available to do that, but it just might be a multi-person kind of, a, or a multi-institution kind of approach to, to really wrap ourselves around this, this issue and, and approach, approach it from many different angles. Mary, we've got one more question for you coming from the online community. With respect to submissions from prominent authors and leaders in a particular discipline, they may not enjoy a double-blind review process and may choose another publication house. Are there any other recommendations? <laughs> that, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, you may come into that situation where people shop around to the, you know, the, the article or the journal, I'm sorry, that's more, more amenable to what they're looking for. Um, and so I think, yeah, that could be a, an, an industry thing to, to address. Um, that kind of, you know, either along with the dual submissions, you know, dual simultaneous submissions, that might be another one, but boy, that's a hard, that's a hard one to get around. Good question. I have one more from online. And um, it looks like it's another very question. As AI becomes more used to and pure, isn't it also possible that AI will be used to generate false information that can't get past these systems. In the end, it seems like ironically that human-based peer review will become even more essential to determining ground truth than it is now. Yes. <laughs> I think that is a big concern as, as it gets better and better. Um, like right now, when I talked about the, uh, the Frankenstein's monsters papers, when you read them, you just laugh. Like it's so obvious. They might be talking about, you know, ge geographic rainfall in a certain region and, um, yeah, nursing out um, injury outcomes. And it's like, what? <laughs> but they're literally spliced together. Um, they will get better and better and um, will be a tool used to plagiarize others' papers. So there's already an issue now, we know. Um, so I think we just have to be careful and get smarter and um, be careful in not giving up too much of the secret sauce and how we're trying to um, identify and um, these types of uh, activities. So. Well, thank you very much, Mary. And thank you, Joanna, also uh, for presenting. And I look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you.